All right, music fans, welcome back. Harmless Dave here talking about real music in real time for real people just like you and just like me. We got a special guest on today, another uh, excellent interview with a top quality musician. Uh, I discovered uh, Michael Aquino because of the band Pride of Lions, which has, they have a brand new album coming out uh, in October. Uh, full disclosure, I've heard the whole thing already and it's amazing. And then I was wondering to myself, who is this guy playing guitar? And then I figured it out. Michael, welcome to the show. Howdy folks, how we doing? David, what's going on? Well, it's another beautiful day. I'm here in sunny Southwest Florida where it's like 95 degrees every day. You're in Chicagoland where eventually you won't be dealing with weather like that. I, let's put it this way, I am not out cutting the grass right now. <laughs> it's cold. Wow, how cold, no, seriously, how cold is it? Today, I wanna say it's not gonna crack 62. Yeah, man, it's only, hasn't even officially, fall begins in like, what, two days, three days or something. Yeah, so what is the last day of summer? Is it the 20th or something? Something like that, yeah, it changes a little bit each year, like the solstice, whatever, whatever they call it. Right. So, so yeah, that's, um, you're welcome, brother. Anytime you want to come down, visit Fort Myers. Uh, we got some nice beaches here. It'll it'll uh, warm you up. It burns, it melts the COVID right off, too. If I love that. that. You know, I'm going to put you on the list. I'm going to come down and do a Florida tour and then just stay with everyone I know down there. So. Yeah, the last interview I did, I had the same, I had the same uh, proposal that was being made. I'll look you up, man. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So I was going to. I was going to call all my friends in Europe and say, hey, remember how you guys said come over and stay with you for like three days and then stay with this guy in this country for three days? I'm like, hey, I'm going to take take you up on that. And they're like, stay in, <laughs> stay in Chicago. Stay in Chicago. <laughs> interesting, interesting town these days, Chicago. Uh, but you got a lot of great musicians that uh, came out of Chicago, and, including an entire band by the name of Chicago. Um and uh, let's talk about my first acquaintance with you, and then we'll, we'll go into some other things here. But uh, you've been involved with uh, my, well, he's not my buddy. I wish he was, and we could talk about this later. Um, Jim Peterick, who I consider to be kind of like a, I want to say a legend. I mean, I don't know what else to call the guy. I mean, you know, I think, I, think, I think he qualifies as that. All right. Uh, so I'm, I'm okay. I mean, started out uh, in the 60s, a little band called Ides of March, uh, and, you know, progressed to this little project called Survivor, eventually, uh, and wrote so many great songs uh, for other bands. I'm thinking like 38 Special, but I mean, you got to go down a huge list and really kind of think it through. And you always see his name, you see whoever then slash Peterick next to it. Yep, you know? It's always woven in there somewhere. And so how, how did you catch his ear? I know you're both from the, the same town, so that might have had something to do with it. Well, let me see. I also teach guitar. I've been teaching guitar since I was about 20. But um, oh. I had a student come into my, into my, my room one day um, by the name of Joe Vanna. Yep. Which you may know Joe. You may know Joe's name. And uh, Joe was taking, I want to say, bass lessons from me. And he's like, hey, and he kept, and he brought this song in. And he's like, and he wanted to learn the song. He's like, I, you know, I know the guy that wrote this. I'm like, Jeff Carlisi? No, Jim Peterick. I'm like, oh, you know Jim? Yeah. I'm like, okay. So then he brings in a Survivor song the next week. And I'm like, <laughs> so through Joe, I met Jim, which led to, it had to be like 1998 or yeah. 90 late 98 or early 99 when Jim was recording for the, his first world stage record. Right. And he called me up and said, Hey, all right, I want you to come in and lay down a lead guitar track on a song, which I walked into the studio. I, I mean, I recorded a bunch of times before I've, I've, I've had bands spent times in the studio, but it was always my own stuff. It wasn't someone else's stuff. Yeah. <laughs> what I didn't know was the song was to miss somebody. Yeah. And it was the Dennis D. Young and Jim Peterick duet song on that first record. Yeah. So I'm like learning the song and in through the door walks Dennis D. Young as well. Now I'm nice. like, oh, no. I'm like, <laughs> no, what do I, come on. So, but 
luckily, I think I did good enough on that song, which led to six more lead tracks and and rhythm tracks on the record. I ended up splitting most of that record with um, my good buddy Joel Hookstra, who yeah. went on to superstardom, you know, and yeah. uh, rock stardom, and uh, I'm proud of him for that. But that's how I met Joel, and as a matter of fact, that's how. Uh, the majority of the Pride of Lions band met was right. somehow recording for Peter Rick. The only people I want to say that played together in the Pride of Lions band before Pride of Lions or World Stage was ever a thing mm -hmm. was Joel Hookstra and Ed Breckenfeld used to back Kathy Richardson. Yeah, and Ed's, Ed's the drummer, right? Eddie Breckenfeld is the drummer, Clem Hayes on bass. Yeah. Um, myself on key uh, on on drums. Christian Cullen on keyboards. Now Christian, I've known since we were both about twenty years old. We went to college together, but there was a big span of time where, you know, you don't hear from someone, you don't see someone, and then you walk into a rehearsal and you you walk into a rehearsal and the guy playing keys two feet away from you, you're like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So, so you guys, so this has been going on for uh, like. Two decades then, technically. Almost. I, the first record came out in 2003, yeah. I think. Yeah. It's, we came out with Pride of Lions shortly after the first Mecca record. Yeah. And, uh, so and, that's, and that, that that's was Joe, right? Joe Vanna. Yeah, that, one, that yeah. was Joe and me. Uh, Jim Peter produced it. That was Joe and Fergie and me and Hungate and Jimmy Nichols. Um. But uh, that was 2002. So, yeah, so Pri the Pride Alliance thing started in 2003. So yeah. that's 17 years, almost 18 years. Yeah, and I got to tell you, I think, I mean, I've listened to all the albums, and they, they actually get better and better as time goes on. Uh, the production value, the writing. I think Jim on this one just said, you know what, screw it. We're, we're, going, we're going full survivor on everybody. I mean, um, we're swinging big on this one, yeah. Yeah, there's a cut. The last track is a tune called "Now," which mm -hmm. sounds a bit like the Damn Yankees to me. And then um, there's another track. I think the word "prisoner" is in the title, and that sounds a lot like a 38 special song to me. That is actually, it's funny when when you when you mentioned to me you wanted to have me on the show. I actually had to go back and listen to the record. Now I don't have like an actual <laughs> physical copy. I, I just have links to tracks. Yeah. And I had to go back because I, I hadn't listened to it in a while. Yeah. And um, You're Not a Prisoner is actually stands out as one of my favorites on, yeah. on, on the recordings. Great. And you play, you play guitar on every track, correct? I play guitar on every tracks as far since basically because Jim and I are, you know, we, we look at it as a two guitar band. Yeah. Some songs feature Jim on lead. Some songs feature me. Mostly... I want to say, at least on this record, probably more of the lead work is handled by me. Mm -hmm. And it's probably like 60, 40 or 70, 30. You know, I know for a fact, you're not a prisoner. I did all the rhythms, all the parts on that. All the lead stuff is all Jim on that one. Yeah. It's, Believe it's, it or not. He's good. He's good. I mean, one Jimmy, thing that, that you can't really, you know, you got Toby Hitchcock in this band. And to me, Toby is an elite vocalist. He's a guy who could sing for Styx. He could sing for Survivor. He could yeah. sing for a number of bands that are still around Absolutely. if they ever decided to replace their singers and so forth. Um, Toby is just a monster. Um, but Jim, on this record, what I realized more than a lot of the other records, that you know, Jim's not a bad vocalist. He's a, he's a decent singer. Jim and, is one of those guys that, as the years have gone by, man, Jim's voice is, I mean, Jim's voice was always good, I thought. Yeah. 17, 18 years later, 20 years later, I'm like, oh, my God, his voice is just getting amazing. Yeah. Stronger, higher. It's it's great. His phrasing's awesome. Yeah. See, and you're <laughs> coming from a guy like you, validating me is good because, you know, I shoot from the hip. And I'm not always, you know, I'm not always right. I, his music is a subjective sport anyway. And people can hear the same thing. And, and I can come away and say, yeah. But, um, you know, you, you see, this is my wheelhouse as far. I mean, I'm a child of the 80s. Grew up listening to all of these bands. And oh, missed sure. them, miss them terribly. 
and we're in the year 2020, which hasn't been the greatest of years. So, oh, oh come on, it's been awesome. <laughs> so an album like this comes along, and I go, okay, yeah, this is going to be a little bit of a soundtrack for me for a while. And um, you know, getting a chance to talk to you about you know the inner workings and working with how is it working with all those guys? Are they are they easy to work with? The Pride Alliance crew is first of all well it's what's cool about it is te technically we've all been working together first of all without toby as world stage since like 99 2000 and then add toby into the mix in 2003 um getting to work with those guys is just like it's like getting to sit like sit down as far as professionally yeah it's like sitting down with one of the best bands on the planet i will put that band up against any band on the planet. I seriously will. And you could ask Phil Champlin from Chicago, the same thing. Yep. Danny Seraphine, Rick Emmett, ask him. You know, there's a reason why they keep coming back and keep doing these shows. Yeah, they're good buddies with Jim. They've become good friends with us, but they're all just like, oh man, I gotta come back and play with this band. You know, yeah. Martha Davis from the motels has said on microphone, on film that playing with that band was uh -huh. like stepping back into the vocal booth and singing her songs against the tracks because every part's there, every tone was there. It's like singing with the record and it's just amazing. And working with them is just so cool. It's just, um, everyone's got their part. You don't have to worry about anybody. Everyone yeah. comes in prepared. Everyone mm -hmm. kills it. Usually, if we spend, like, this is, if, like, let's say we had a show coming up mm -hmm. in sometime in 21, okay, yes. which would be <laughs> awesome, which would be great. Yeah. But we, Pride of Lions has not played in a while because of COVID, mm -hmm. and, you know, we don't get over to Europe all that much. Yeah. We could set a rehearsal with a set list. And I guarantee you, we could walk into that rehearsal, play that set list down like we just walked off tour. That it, that band is that good, and they are. And what makes it even better, it's like a family. We're yeah. just all brothers and best friends, and we spend more time laughing and telling jokes than we do playing music. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> That's you know what I love to hear that. That's you know it. You hear about these bands that are just they're they're doing it for the money or they're they're just you know they know they're a good band but they don't get along with each other and they got to kind of put up with each other and so forth. Um, you know, and it, it's just good to hear that. It's sad that the music industry itself has kind of moved on and and doesn't. You know, you you mentioned World Stage last year. They came out with an album and. You know, yeah. Um, Dennis DeYoung had a track. Jason Sheff had a track. Kevin Cronin had a track. Uh, Don Barnes had a track. And I'm like, this is like the music all stars. I'm sitting there going, yeah. why? I mean, what is wrong with American radio that that when these stations that play the same ten classic rock songs all day long? I mean, I've heard Hotel California. I love it. But can we put on one of these right next to it? I mean, I don't yeah. know what, what's going on with the music industry, it's something that I, I get on my soapbox a lot about. Um, I think it's something bigger than you and I. It's something that's ultimately not going to go away until they come up with a, a strong enough third form of, of, of getting music out there. I mean, yeah. AM used to rule the radio station, you know, and then all of a sudden FM came along and they were pushing a whole different thing than AM was. Right. Now yeah. it's like AM what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's well, AM? Yeah, it, people people want that you know that that fidelity that you're going to get from an FM stereo signal, yeah. um, but but you're right. I mean, I came up through the ranks, and there were still AM radio stations playing playing music, and it was crazy. I think in the '80s they actually developed a radio that was AM stereo for a while, and they tried to force oh, that right. on everybody. If you remember that, and oh, it, vaguely, it worked for like six months, but people were like, hey. I'm still getting the the pop and the snaps and all that stuff, even though it's in stereo. So everybody kind of just went back to FM, and that was the end of that. And it was the end of that. But it's it's now like what gets what gets tested. You know, everything gets focus tested, and 
Um, is this going to work? Is this song in a movie? Is it in a video game? Um, you know, it's, see, there's, there's it's weird. I think in a way there's, there's, it's good that there's, that many places now that you can place a song, but in a way it can bite you because, well, I've got so many places I can place it now, which means now I got so many places I could place it that might be wrong. Yeah. And if you place it in the wrong spot, no one's going to hear from it again. Add to the fact that almost everything now is a download. Yeah. Um, which, which is okay. Um, a great, <laughs> a great, I mean, what, what I mean by a download is most of what everyone's hearing is an MP3. Yeah. Which is a squashed, horrible sounding way to music. Yeah. It's not vinyl. It's not wave file is better. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's yeah. better, there's better ways to listen to music and actually hear the full production value after we put thousands of hours and dollars and more hours into production and making it sound huge and then you're going to listen to it on these little earbuds that are just big. And yeah. It's, and it's compressed onto an MP3. But when everything's a download, you know, I talked with Jim years ago when everything started going to streaming. Because I, I wanted to get his take on it. Because, yeah. I mean, we're talking about a guy who's, I mean, this guy's <laughs> written number ones, top tens. I mean, yes. you want to talk about a full-time guy who's who's paid the bills and carved out an amazing career as a songwriter which means mailbox money you know mm -hmm. and sure. recognition and great 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 songs <clears throat> I said how does this affect what you do how you do all this and, you know he said well because I wasn't too keen on it yeah. and I'm still up in the air about it you know because streaming is different from downloads right and he said you know in the 60s, a lot of bands would cut singles and you'd cut a B-side. Yeah. And you'd put it on a little 45 and you'd sell the single with the B-side or it would end up in like a jukebox right. with a B-side. And eventually when you had enough singles, you would cut two more songs, put them all together and make a record. Right. And then, and he's like, so for a long time, it was singles. You didn't record a record, you recorded singles. Yeah. And he's like, and then he recorded records and then it got everything through the eighties got blown out of proportion. And then the nineties and all of a sudden, boom, what are we back to record yeah. a single and make it a download? He's like, it's the same as a jukebox. Yeah. And I said, very interesting. And the only thing difference now is a lot of stuff is streamed. Right. And we've all seen the argument on that. Yeah. Yeah. So well, not only that, obviously the revenue stream isn't what it was when you were um, selling, you know, hard products, whether it was a 45 or a cassette or. Um, yeah, I want to say, I mean, I used to get something every quarter from ASCAP. I'm part of ASCAP. And I want to say now after they roll it over, I probably see something from ASCAP every three or four years. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, that's what it's become. Yeah. Um, so you've been on, tell us about some other records you've been on then, if you, you're part of ASCAP. Um, well, I did, I did my own record back in 2005 called Your Side of Town, but other stuff that um, I'm on that is of recognition would have been uh, the first Mecca CD, yep. uh, the two Kelly Keegy CDs. Okay, Night Ranger Guy, yeah. I did more on the second one. Most of the second record, I want to say, most of that record was Red Beach and I. Yeah. Uh, there, there was some stuff that wasn't either of us. Um, I did the last Dennis D. Young CD. Yeah. Um, not this I, current, not the one he just came out with. Were you on that one too? Yep. Oh, wow. Yep. So that'll, yep. a lot of my fans will like that. I'm a big DDY uh, guy. So, you know, and I did, yeah, because I did, Dennis called called me in to do a song, and he's like, the record's almost done. <laughs> and then I get called over, we do three three more songs. It's almost done. Finally, <laughs> you know, after, I think, I don't think there's one track. I, I would have to look. There might be one or two, but I, uh, yeah. I think I'm on every track. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, 
Jim's on every track. August is on, on a lot of them. Jimmy's on a lot of them. I'm, it's, it's like there are times where all of us are on the track. I mean, even Dennis said to me, he's like, hey, do you remember exactly what songs you're on? I said, <laughs> you never told me the names. <laughs> so I don't know. Wow. I, I, I'd have to listen to it. You know, even if there's like two, two notes. Oh, yeah, I do those two notes. That's it. So, no, but, uh, so I can put you down as guitarist for Pride of Lions and Dennis DeYoung. Yeah, I, I would do Pride of Lions since I'm not in the Dennis DeYoung band. Right. It's all technically yeah. not his band. I couldn't, I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't lay creed to that. Yeah. As to, I played guitar on his last CD. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm in the credits as Boku Guitars, which means <laughs> we both couldn't remember. We know there's a ton of them. <laughs> but we don't remember exactly where all of them are. Um, that album, that album came out really, really well. I mean, it, it's, it's a great a, album. Julian Lennon's a, on there. Uh, yep. It, there's a lot of very poignant uh, cultural observations that Dennis, Den, Dennis must be. When you sit down and talk with Dennis DeYoung, that must be a blast because that guy, he's like stream of consciousness. He just goes he's stream of consciousness, and he's a, he's, he's just. He's awesome. Dennis is so cool. He is fun to sit down and talk to because what's great about guys like Dennis and Jim Peterick yeah. is they're just one of the guys. Yeah. Everyone's like, sure. I look at him's like, yeah, still I can look at that's Dennis DeYoung and that's Jim Peter. Oh my God. And then to sit there, <laughs> but sit there and go, these are my homies though. You know, yeah. I can call them. Hey dude, I'm in the neighborhood. You mind if I drop by? Yeah. Come on by. Cool. You know? Yeah, that's. You know, a, I mean, there was one time where I kind of, I did have to pinch myself a little bit. It was okay. Uh, Good story. Go ahead. We were recording stuff for the Dennis DeYoung record. Yeah. Because Jim co-wrote a lot of that stuff. Yeah. And Jim played on it. He also played bass on some of it too, I think. And we're sitting. I just recorded something, and we're sitting there at Dennis's house. Yeah. In front of the board, Dennis is sitting here. I'm sitting here and Jim's sitting here and we've all kind of got like our fingers on the faders. We're listening back to a track. We're listening back to a mix. And I'm going, who else has had this guy on this side and this guy on this side? I'm like, man, I am one lucky dude. <laughs> you yeah. know? I agreed. Agreed. And, you know, the, the people watch this channel, they'll agree 100%. I mean, um, that's it's just a great story. So, um, Obviously, most of your output as far as contributing to records has been since what, the 90s and beyond? Or what, did you do anything prior to that? I started doing studio stuff probably late 90s, right when I started like on other people's records. Yeah. Uh, as a studio rat, as a hired gun, probably since 99. That's probably when it started. Once I got in with, with, with Jim, I got in Larry Millis, who does all the co-producing and engineering for all Jim's stuff. Um, Larry is a producer on his own and has a bunch of artists and clients that he, he has. And yeah, so I've become the artist, become the guitar player for that stuff. And through Larry and I, we have some clients that we both co-produce. So there's, yeah, there's a, there's a long list. I've, I've tried to actually keep, a list of who and it's like i gave up yeah are you connected I, with anybody in uh, in nashville because you've got a, a lot of country uh, cred there street cred uh i am cr uh, connected with a company called big palm entertainment uh yeah. which is based in chicago and nashville it's a buddy of mine brad and i mm -hmm. uh we were writing uh songs for an artist named ross clayton Mm -hmm. that we were able we were trying to get him signed by warner brothers and we got him we got us a we got a showcase for ross in front of warner brothers so we still have uh good connections with um warner brothers in nashville and there's other just other players lots of other writers that we pick up along the way um my job with them is basically to act as a writer if yeah. there's something they, they need help with co-writing or uh, they, Hey, we just got this artist. We're looking for stuff. That's kind of like on along the lines of Montgomery Gentry or this, and this is the tagline I got. Go, here you go. Here's the football got run. Got so I, there's, there's a lot of emailing messaging songs back and forth. There's lots of songs that get written when we're not even in the same room. He might send me something, say, Hey, 
I need a bridge for this. And I'll do the bridge. I'm like, hey, check this out for the chorus. And he'll be like, okay, yeah, I got it. And yeah. then, yeah, it's that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't get down there. There was maybe three years ago, there was a point where I was going down there every other month or so, flying down there. It was one of those where you would literally get on a plane, fly down there, record an acoustic track, co-produce it for an hour, get on a plane and fly back. <laughs> wow. You're in the air more than you're on the ground, right? You're definitely in the air and traveling more than you're on the ground. That's for yeah. sure. But uh, I don't get down to Nashville as much as I used to. I wish, I mean, I would love to get back down there more. So hopefully that changes soon. All right. I see a, I see a wall of guitars behind you, which makes a great oh. background, by the way. Oh, yes. Um, uh, tell, us, tell us about some of those guitars. And what I want to know, too, is um, has any one guitarist influenced your playing style? I know you went to school for this and you probably were taught by some really, you know, great professors and so forth. Okay. Well, first of all, guitarists that influenced me, my biggest influence from day one, mm -hmm. even though, well, even, I mean, I've gone to school for jazz and I play a lot of country and I play a lot of jazz and blues and rock and probably the biggest influence on me from day one has always been Brian May. Oh, wow. Okay. Always. Wow. Um, that was the first sound that I heard on record when I was like seven or eight years old that I said, man, I want to know how to do that. Yeah. yeah. So Brian May, but I'd say for different styles, there's different players. Sure. Um, other rock players, Lukather. Yeah. Well, you so say you got like Brian May, Lukather, huge Billy Gibbons fan. You know, a lot of those, I mean, basically anyone who, I mean, Clapton, yeah, you know, along the blues route, easily the two that stand out for me was BB King and Stevie Ray. And obviously, after delving into Stevie Ray, you delve back and you pick up guys like Hubert Sumlin, Albert mm -hmm. King, Buddy yeah. Guy, yeah. Uh, country guitar players. Mm, that's a tough one. Brent Mason, obviously, and then you start working back. Albert Lee, Vince Gill. Yeah. Chet Atkins, you know, it's basically there's the lineage we all draw from. Once right. you find someone where they are on that path and you start working your way back, it's just like a tree. You can, no matter what branch, you start working your way back. Oh, okay. And you pick that up and you pick that up. But um, what's your most go to guitar back there? Depends. Well, first <laughs> of all, since we were talking about Pride Alliance, yeah. The Black Les Paul, that's the Pride Alliance Les Paul. All right. That's been on the live, that's been on every record um, since the second record. I didn't get it till after the first record. Okay. So that's been on every record since the second record. It's been on the uh, live DVD. You'll see that one on the live DVD and the live stuff as well. Uh, that Strat, the blue Strat, usually mm -hmm. takes care of all my clean Strat stuff on all the Pride Alliance stuff. If it's not that Strat, it's Jimmy 65 Red that's I love dearly. Also, that blue strat is was one of the main guitars on the first Mecca CD. Cool. So that cut the lead on a lot of those. Very cool. Uh, this blue strat, the black West Paul, and the Framus, the wood looking Les Paul up there. Yeah. Uh, those three guitars did a lot of work on Dennis's record. Nice. Okay. Um, let me see. There's an elect. There's a red electric twelve over here that I do. I do a lot of stuff with that on the cornerstones of rock, which is with Jim and the Ides of March when we back like the Crying Chains, the Buckinghams. Uh, That's a cool gig. Oh, it's it's a really cool gig, and you know the shit. Jimmy Sons, the shit shadows of night, Gloria. Come on. Yeah. Who doesn't want to play play that with that guy? You know. Yeah. Come on. That's fun. Um little jazz master over there that I break out on a lot of sessions. Um, man mandolin for, for, for jingles, dobro, a couple acoustics. Uh, and uh, my jazz box is over here. Just a Gibson nice. and old Yamaha. A couple tellies on the ground, lap steel. So, and a bunch of amps, which I think, well, I think there's five amps here and only three work. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, they're, they're good. They're good to have there. You know, it gives you. Gives they're you great that. to set my coffee on. You know. Yeah, I use it as a table, right? So, well, I'll be honest. I don't feel like uh, lifting up a hundred and twenty pound Fender Twin and bringing it down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so, when I was twenty eight. No, I'm not gonna do that anymore. Call, call a handyman. Call, call someone else. Exactly. Um, so you're also in. Um, we'll wrap it up here soon. This has been a great, a great interview. That's been you're, fun, man. You're also in a, a group uh, locally called Lucky Town. Is that correct? Lucky Town. Well, I used to be. We used to oh. have it. Um, a lot of my local stuff has probably kind of like flown underneath the the radar since yeah. Lucky Town. Um, Lucky Town was a country was was my last country band in town. Lucky after Lucky Town, I started. Locally in Chicago, I play with a band called Junkyard Groove, mm -hmm. uh, which we do a lot of acoustic stuff. That's how we're getting through this COVID yeah. season. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot, as long as you can do acoustic shows and you can play outside, you can do gigs. Yeah. There's not that many. You have a very small amount of places that are still having them. Right. But that's how we've been getting by. Now that it's getting colder, we're all kind of getting prepared to be unemployed for about seven months yeah. um but there's lucky town i play with an eagles tribute band called one of these nights nice uh i play with um matter of fact i got to play with a couple of those guys tonight yeah and, and sunday we play but and then lisa mcclowry who has a link to jim peterick as well lisa mcclowry i work with her she has a share tribute called the beat goes on nice that's We're national with that that's actually also Ed Breckenfeld from Pride Alliance and Clem Hayes from Pride Pride Alliance. So we we put put some of the boys back together for that. Um, and I know there's a bunch. There's about three or four other bands locally that I play with. So it's doing doing just this for a living. I've got to try to keep the calendar somewhat full. So there's not one band that can especially this day and age that can right. support, you know, so you need to have a whole list of subs to call and book yourself up as much as you can, you know? Very good. Very good. Well, um, just great talking with you, Michael. Um, best of luck to you. I'm hoping that Thank this you, uh, COVID stuff goes away so everybody can get back to normal. And uh, uh, again, folks, if you're looking for the new Pride of Lions album, I think it comes out October 9th. October 9th is what I've been told. Yeah, on Frontiers. And it's it's amazing. And Michael is all over it. Jim and I Michael. am. I even made a list of what I'm on and what I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am on it. No, that's we've we've pretty much stuck to our plan from day one on how we run with that band. It's, everyone's on it and uh split it up where we can so everybody gets a little taste of love. You know any any word on when you're recording the next one? <laughs> I don't know. Knowing, you know, knowing Jim and knowing Serafino, they may already have plans. They're, yes. I know they may already have plans for another one. And you never know. I could get, all of a sudden get an email after this, like on October 10th or October 9th at 1030 at night. Out, yeah. Hey, guys, can you do a session? We got three more tracks. Aren't is, Isn't the record done? Yeah, this is for a follow up. You yeah. know, you never know. It might be. Now, Serafino is a one-man melodic rock, uh, you know, show keeping the whole thing alive or helping. And uh, God bless him for it. God exactly. bless him for doing it. Exactly. And uh, you know, he's reached out to me a couple of times. He, I guess he watches the video. So. Uh, oh, cool. We'll say hi to Serafino. Serafino. Yeah. How you doing? <laughs> Ciao, amigo. All right, Michael Aquino uh, from Chicago, where it's getting cold. Thank you so much for being on the show. David, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. All right. Take care.